All right, good morning. This is Sunday School, Acts chapter 17, and verse number 22, please. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Acts chapter 17, and verse number 22. So we see Paul being uh, dragged before uh, those in Oropagus, a.k.a. Mars Hill. And so Oropagus, what that is, is it's kind of like a, uh, a court area, and it would be, um, Mars Hill's a big, huge slab of, I think it's marble, and it's really high up, uh, and it's kind of outside of where the not the Pantheon, but the Parthenon is. You always mess those two up. But the Parthenon, which is that big building, it has the columns that everybody's always seen, you know, and we kind of look at those columns and we use that for uh, legal, right? If you ever see like a, go to a law website, what do you see? You see columns, just like you see at the, at the Parthenon, <laughs> you see those at the Supreme Court, right? Same type of big, huge columns that indicate, you know, pillars, right? And the foundation and the, and the, and the, and the doctrine and the teaching and that type of thing. And for, Paul, one of the questions that I, I thought about here in this passage is that if you notice, it says in verse 19 that they took him and brought him unto Oropagus. So I wonder if this was more willing, right? Meaning, what, what, was this a willful thing? Or really was this, hey, we're going to bring you to the high up elders here at Mars Hill, and we're going to let you explain all this new stuff that you're talking about. Because that's why in the end of verse 19 he says, may, may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is, right? Because as it says, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there, notice this next phrase, spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Now, when you start to think about the Greek mythology aspect of things and, and, and just the, 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 the mythological characters and the superstitious nature that these guys are, I think we need to realize how extreme this is. Okay? This is like a super extreme superstitious group of individuals and people. And that's why in, in verse number 22, when Paul is brought to Oropagus, it, it's going to take him. So from, you know, he's in Athens and he's going through, Athens is the main area, but then he's going from, if you look at a map, I was going to print one out, but I didn't have time this morning. I was going to print out a map of like the, that, this ancient area. And you can see that they go through, here's a shrine to this guy, and here's a shrine to this guy. And this is a shrine here and a shrine there. And then a hill to this guy and a this to that guy. And the list, I, I printed it out just because I wanted to show you how ridiculous it is. This is, this is five and a half pages long of all of the different Greek mythological gods and goddesses. I, I mean, that's crazy. Th think about that. They have to come up with this many gods and goddesses. To me, it testifies, well, well yeah, you, you obviously believe that there's some form of a higher power. There is some type of supreme intelligence, a creator, designer, whatever you, whatever you might be. And, you know, of course, some of the famous ones like... Um, Di Dionysus, right? Dionysus. He's the guy that's the guy, god of wine and pleasure. And, like, that's one that everybody always likes. And, like, you know, of course, Zeus, right? The leader of the Olympic gods, the god of lightning and thunder in heaven. And it's just interesting to go through this whole list and you go, they got a god for everything. They got Plutus. He's the god of wealth, you know? You, which one do you like? Well, I'm really wealthy, so I'm really a fan of Plutus, right? Which one do you like? Uh, I'm a fan of uh, Nike, right? Nike's a god in here. Nike, that he's the goddess of that she's the goddess of victory, right? So you, you just keep going and going and going down all this list, and to me, this is what this is what really Christianity has become and done with with Jesus Christ. They have saints and goddesses. Well, yeah, you sure you have the saints too because it's very similar, saints right? So I, I like these patron saints and I like certain ones, and these guys appeal to me a little bit more. But with but even even crazier is they'll take Jesus Christ and they basically make him one of these gods, whatever fits their mold. So we think, oh, this is ridiculous. Who would believe in all of this? Hey, this is so superstitious. Well, the, the church has done this with Christ, and they've changed him into some picture, some image, or some mirror that they want him to be, and that is a relativistic mindset that really is um, what what I think the world is headed towards. Ecumenicalism or, or the... the, the the one world, one religion type of thing. That's that's where we're that's where they're trying to go right now, right? Anything that happens, well, united we stand and united this, and we're together and everything, and we're all people. And well, thanks, because that's what Paul says. He says we're of one blood. In just a second, right? He's determined the times, you know, the habitations I said before, and we are of one blood. So at the end of the day, does God see red and yellow, black and white? No. But did He create that? Yes. And did he create it for specific reasons and purposes? Yes. And we're going to look at that today for a very specific reason. And, and we'll get in that just in, in a minute. But 
So Acts chapter 17, in verse number uh, 21, again, for all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else. Their hobby was to just hear or tell or, 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 or learn of some new thing. So Paul gets brought before here. He stands in the midst of Mars Hill, which is also called Oropagus, which is, again, a, a, I think of it like the Supreme Court. You're going for a bunch of really high-up elders, and, and they had, if you look, the, the Romans kind of allowed them to maintain this autonomy and this court structure because it was very conservative in, in their approach, and, and their, their rules of justice and law were very sound. And so when he stands up, the first thing he says and I think, yeah, this is probably pretty obvious as he travels through Athens and, and get, making his way up to Oropagus and sees, well, here's the God of this one. And here's the God of this one. I mean, just think about this. You couldn't even keep all this straight. How, how could you possibly remember all these God's names and all the things that they do? I mean, there, there's, there's well over 100 listed here. So he looks around and goes, ye men of Athens, I perceive, and of course the perception comes from just his, his awareness of the surroundings. He goes, I perceive that, and notice this, in all things... Ye are too superstitious. See, all things means just how they live their life is about superstition. And unfortunately, many in Christianity, many just in the world, do that same thing. Well, I, I, I'm thinking that there's some ulterior motive here of God to teach me some random thing. And I'll never forget, it was, it was the time in my life where I really said, I, I really contemplated on whether or not I was really a Christian. I was driving in the car. I was driving down 118th. Uh, 100, 100 second, 118th, Brian Derry, whatever you want to call it. I was driving over there, and I'm listening to, like, Chuck Swindoll and a couple other guys from Moody, and they're sitting there, and they're talking about how, well, you know, sometimes you just, there's these things that happen in your life, and you sit there and you just try to figure out, what's God trying to tell me in this? And then I remember, like, I was going through some health issues, and I'm going, oh, this, is, this sounds confusing. And so the guy flat out says, and I know it can be downright confusing to try to figure out what God's trying to tell you and teach you. And I'm like, oh, I don't want, I don't want anything to do with this. My life already has so much confusion. I don't, I don't need any more. Is this, what I, is this really what I'm all about? And I, I hold those guys up in high regard. I, I, I worship those men. I thought they were very intelligent theologians. And I, I lived a lot of my life thinking that these guys are super smart and like intelligent. And I should listen to them. And they have all the answers. And then listening to that, it was, it, I really sat there and said, maybe, maybe Christianity is kind of wacko. That's what I thought. I thought maybe this is not, this is something, something's not right. Because to sit here and try to figure out what God's trying to teach you, that's the superstitious nature of how, how things go on. Instead of going, look, hey, here's the deal. We have a cursed, fallen world. And there are a lot of ramifications that come as a result of a cursed and fallen world. And those are not God's intentions for your life. Okay? Now, and, 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 and not to digress on a whole thing about the will of God and the digressions of, of what we should, you know, be really looking for. But our, our, our mindset should be one that... Uh, this, this world is not our home, we're just a passing through kind of deal, right? As much as, as, much as a way to say it, it's, it's really, there's no other better way to, to say it than that. So in this thing, he says, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. What is superstition? It's stuff not founded upon fact. It's, it's when you let your mind run wild. In other words, I, I, Paul says, casting down imagination in every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity, right? So what does that mean? It's, that means your mind likes to run away. Your mind loves to go out and do things. Your mind is very powerful. It'll go out and tell you all kinds of stuff. You get out of the Word of God, and like two weeks later, you're like, man, what, what justification? Okay, I got, I got to get back into this. I got to get like a, you know, because you get out of it, and you let the world pervert your mind a little more. You let, you know, TV and the rest of the stuff, and all of a sudden, you know, your mind has got all kinds of little superstitions and things, so you have to bring yourself in back down you have to bring your mind back into captivity to the obedience of christ it really is a, it is a it is a task and a chore to do that it's something you do on a daily basis if you don't your mind will run i have several friends of mine who have unfortunately just gone off the deep end on this stuff and i can't even have a, have a conversation anymore about the bible without hearing something like Dude, I heard that Trump, he's associated with the Antichrist. And the Antichrist in the, in, the, in the mystery Babylon. And like, dude, we're talking. And I'm just like, what are you talking about? And I've said that to a couple of my buddies. I'm like, what are you? I said, Phil, what are you talking about? Dude, I really have no clue what you're talking about. What, is, what, what benefit is this? How did you come up with this? You heard this from somewhere. Why? Well, he's like, I heard this one guy say this. And I thought that, yeah, you thought. But your, your brain is, is running wild. And you need to bring that into captivity. You need to you need to bring it back down. And again, when it says it exalted against exalted itself against the knowledge of God, you're trying to say, well, I think I know better in my mind, and not coming back 
to the scriptures and not coming back to the obedience of the word of God. So for, for them to be superstitious, I look at superstition as mostly, it, it's no different than magic, right? You're being fooled. You're thinking about something, you're like, wow, that was so crazy. No, that's a magic trick. That's not, it's not what you think it is. You think it's something because you're so amazed. It's like that Penn and Teller show. Have you seen that, the Fool Us? One of the coolest ideas, you know, Penn and Teller, of course, very famous magicians, and they go through a show in which they give individuals the opportunity to fool them with a unique or, or novel magic trick that they've come up with. And if they do fool them, then they get to go to Las Vegas and, and do the opening act for Penn and Teller, which is pretty cool. So, they, you know, these guys are doing tricks, and it's amazing, though, because Penn and Teller are historians of ma magic as well. So they go back and say, you know, as they're finishing the trick, I'm like, man, that was a crazy trick. How in the world do you do that? And, you know, of course, Teller doesn't talk, just Penn does. And so Penn Gillette will go, well, I'm just going to mention one thing, uh, hamburgers. And the guy's like, yep, yep, okay, all right, all right. You know, and they, they leave. That's it. They, they won't talk about it anymore because they don't want to give up their secret. And it was always like that. I'm going to bring up one little word, um, butterflies and rainbows. Oh, yep, that's it. That's it. It's always something really weird. You're like, what does he mean by that? See, I'm always trying to Google it afterwards and trying to figure out, like, what is this? What is this thing? Because, you know, the masses are, 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 are duped. The masses are literally duped. And these two guys are sitting there going, nah, 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 I, I know exactly what you did. And that's cool because that's kind of, I look at it like that's the guys who can almost compare that to the doctrinal aspect of things. Somebody can bring in something, look, I mean, the Bible says this, and there's some cool stuff here. Well, no, I can go in and, and be a man approved of God so that those heresies can be quickly, oh, no, come on, that's ridiculous. Or come on, what are you, that, that's an imagination, right? That's something that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, right? So to be superstitious is ridiculous. You don't need to be superstitious with the Bible. The Bible is not superstitious. People say, say that, the, you know, um, that it's fairy tales or it's, uh, and, 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 you know, that's why we have a problem with that. We have such an uh, amazing you know, CGI and, and the, the video world that we can create now, it's pretty, it's pretty intense. And so to these guys, I mean, can you imagine what they would be able to see and go, wow, this is, this is, this is, this is mind blowing. So they've been, they've been hearing about Paul's new doctrine, which really, what is the primary doctrine as we talked about last week? It's the resurrection. So as we said, the, the, the Epicureans are hedonistic in nature. Epicureans are like, dude, we're living for this guy right here. All day, every day, Pain, we need that gone. Pleasure, we need more of that. If it gives me pleasure, it's on the top of the list. It's the greatest good. That's what they believe. I mean, isn't that really what most atheists are? Sure, they're Epicurean in nature. The Stoics, of course, a little bit more pantheistic in, in, their, in their natural approach to the world and that the world is, uh, the nature is God and that they have, you know, these are the gods to us. But at the same time, they're very similar in a hedonistic self-centered, self-gratification, whatever makes me happy, makes me happy, and that's where we're going to go. So to these guys, to hear that there's a resurrection, they go, whoa, 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 that, well, what happens in the resurrection? Well, there's a judgment, and that's what we're going to see, why Paul says, in the times of this ignorance, uh, God winked at, but now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath, what? He hath appointed a day, and I'm kind of quoting this, but because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world and righteousness by who? By that man whom he hath ordained, where if he hath given assurance, he's guaranteed you that it's going to happen, wherein he raised Jesus Christ. And he proved it. He says, well, he's going to raise you. He's going to put you in judgment. He did it through Jesus Christ, and he can raise you too. So to them, they go, uh-oh, what does that really tell you? Well, now, this idea of, of self-control, this idea of temperance is necessary. Because it's not just all about you. You do need to you know, exercise self-control because you will be accountable or responsible for the actions that you have done. And it isn't just do whatever you want to do and there's no repercussions. So that is a little alarming to somebody who's just, as I said you know, last week, YOLO, you only live once. They don't care. They're just out there doing it. They're, they're, just, they're, they're running it. They're doing whatever pleases them. And as I said, that's why they make up all these gods. If they find a god that they like, yeah, this is, this is the god of having multiple wives. Aphrodite, and, you know, we can, whatever it is, it makes me happy. That's my god. I like that one, right? That's the superstitious nature. And as Paul says, he says, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious because every part of them was superstitious. As they just walked through, everything had an, a secondary motive. And he says, for I pass by. He says, I'm walking up here to Oropagus. I'm walking up to Mars Hill. And I pass by, and look at this. He says, I beheld your devotions. And this is really important because what Paul does is he doesn't go, you 
heretics, you sinners, you're all going to hell. I can't believe you. What does he do here? In my opinion, because he's going before a court, he's being very lawyerly, but he's also being very respectful. See, when he says, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I think back to Acts chapter number 14, when he's in Iconium, and go to Acts chapter 14 in, in a second, and in verse number 15, and, and when they go, the gods are come down to us, right? They say they're Mercurius and, and Jupiter, and they're, wow, look at these gods. And, and you know, Paul and Barnabas are like, no, 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 we are not. We are just their witnesses. And in verse 15, look how he says it. Notice this. He's not pandering here, but he says, he says it in a way that, that really, I, I believe, stresses the point that, that we like how you are being reverent toward a God, quote unquote, but your, your reverence needs to be directed toward the proper God, not us. He says, sirs, why do these things? We also are men, notice this, of like passions with you. What is the like passions that Paul shares with these individuals? Well, the worship and the respect and the reverence of God. If they see deity, they're going to respect that. So that's what Paul's trying to do. He's like, well, let's take something that is a, is a unity aspect between us. We may not have the agreement between what that God is, but let's say you do respect the God. Well, let me, as Paul says over here, you know, he says, read, read again. He says, he, he says, we are also men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made, time, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are there and is. And so we'll go back to that passage in just a second, but... The same thing here in verse 23, for I passed by and I beheld your devotions. See, he didn't say, I passed by and I beheld your idolatry, right? How, how, how well received is it going to be if you walk up and you didn't call them idolaters? Probably not going to happen. Not gonna get, you're not going to get very far. It's like if you go into a Catholic's house and be like, why are you burning those candles? You're such an idiot. What are those beads for, you moron? What do you think those are going to do for you? That, you're so stupid. Do you think you're going to get very far? No. Now let me, let me ask you the question. Are you wrong? No. But is that delivery going to be one that will be well received? No. See, it's, I'm not asking you to pander at all. You don't pander to people. Pandering is, is giving somebody what they want to hear, and you're doing it because you really, deep down inside, just want to make them like you, really, right? So we're not making people like them. Paul's trying to find some common ground here, and when he uses that word devotions, I looked at it. I mean, I read that. I'm, I, I kept reading him, like, for I passed by, and I beheld your devotions. I passed by, and I beheld your devotions. And, you know, I'm thinking, I passed by, and I beheld how wicked idolaters you are. And I beheld your witchcraft, and I beheld your superstitious, you know, uh, Baal worship. But no, no, no. I beheld your devotions, and I like how he says it. He says, and I found an altar with this inscription. And so notice what he does. He skips over all the other gods. He doesn't go, and you know what? That stupid, you know, a Aether and Anthea and Apollo and Ares. And I, dude, I gave you this list. I assume you guys have just walked in, but this list is like five or six pages long, and it's just all these different you know, gods and goddesses that they have. It's, it's crazy. And so he doesn't even bother addressing any of them. Why does he need to, why does, why, right? Well, let's just take it to the main issue. And that is, well, there's this one that you did because you have all of these, but just in case you forgot one. And I think that's really interesting because it's, that shows that they really have a desire to make sure that they cover their bases. He says, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. See, if you remember back in verse 16, notice this. When Paul comes in to Athens, well, now, he says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he did what? Notice this. It wasn't that he didn't agree, think that they were wholly given to idolatry. It says he, he believes that. He says that the spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Everybody's an idolater. I mean, have you ever been, anybody been to like China or any, any place over there or like India? I mean, it, I've not been personally, but I've had people tell me stories about how you just walk everywhere and there's idols and little things. Just every place you turn, there's little shrines here and a little idol here. And really, the Jews are kind of like that. The Jewish friends that I have, they put those little, what are they called? Uh, mezuzahs or little things that goes on the, no, the mezuzah is the little thing that goes on the side of the door. Have you seen that? You familiar with the mezuzah? I think it's a mezuzah. It's a little thing. You, you'll always know a Jewish, you know, 
whether it be a house or a, a business, because I'll put those mezuzahs on the door. They're little, on the in, in, inside of the frame of a, of a door, it's a little slanted thing that has some Hebrew writing on it, and it's, you know, kind of like, and I always think about this, I'm like, it's kind of cool, that, that's kind of like when they put the blood around the doorpost. That's what they want, that's what, it's, that's what they're kind of trying to do, that, you know, this is a, this is a blessed house, a house that believes in Jehovah, and we need to, ma you know, maintain you know, our, our relationship with God by showing that, hey, we do, we do have this. I've, 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 one, of the, one of my clients has a couple of them through every door, like every walkway. I'm like, well, how many walkways do you need? Like, you go into his main door and it's in there. Then you go into his bedroom and it's in there. And it's like, well, why do you have to have them on every door? Like in your closet, then into your bathroom. Like as you, you walk through a doorway, well, I think that's the superstitious nature of what they are. Like, well, maybe we should make sure to just cover our bases and put them on all the doors. So I believe it's called, a, I believe it's called a mezuzah. But, it's weird, does it? Have it like that? Do you need to put one on facing each way so that as you walk through, it's got to be? I think it's always on the right side. So when you walk in, is, I can't believe any of you guys have seen this. Probably now that I tell you this, you'll, you'll, you'll see them all the time. It's kind of like when you get a car. You know, like you get like a, oh, I just bought a new truck. Everybody's got that truck now because you're now looking for it. There's some, I forget the term, but you, you find, you, you're aware of something and you see it more often than when you didn't. But so that's the superstitious nature, but just the same thing. I have a client of mine who has, uh, he's got all these elephant gods and the little he head gods in his, in his office. And I'm looking at stuff, I'm like, dude, what is all of this? And these, I walk in there and my, my spirit gets stirred too. And I go, this is creepy, dude. This is creepy. Like you have all of these weird, I just don't like it. I, I feel, I feel that this is not correct, right? I, I, as Paul says here, the whole, the whole city was given to idolatry. He doesn't disagree that they're all idolatrous. He just is going to go about this in a proper way. And the people can take this and spin it however they want to, but make it clear at the very end, Paul gives them the gospel. And he, may, he tells them, he says, yeah, the times of this ignorance God has winked at, right? He, 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 we're going to talk about what that phrase means, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent because the Godhead is not to be thought of as gold or silver or, or art or, 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 or you know, graven art of man's devices, right? But that you are, if, if, you're, if you believe that you are, are gods in the sense that you know, it's, we're, we're blood and flesh, then why would you be worshiping something dead? Why would you worship something you created? That doesn't make any sense. Wouldn't it be greater or higher than you? And he goes in, in a second, discusses the philosophical poet, who talks about that, but, so verse 23, for as I passed by, I beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Do you think they're a little excited to hear about that? I think so. I think they're probably like, okay, all right, this is great, tell me about this guy, what, what, what's he do? And it's a very lawyerly rebuttal and a very lawyerly defense. Now, in, in not to spend a lot of time, just go to Romans 1, because this is more for the recording than the guys that are here. But Romans 1, in verse, I just want to read 18, 19, 20, 21, and, and 20, 22, 23. So just, give us, just read through this. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness, because of that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, there's that word, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Whenever you see, you know, little gods, uh, little idols, m most of what I see is, is like a combination of like, you know, animal person type of thing or, or weird the elephant head with the man body or just like what, what is that where did you come up with that so you have you're 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 not you're basically using the creation to create the gods and where it's like well where did the creation come from back up a step right the creation can't create it itself right it had to come from the creator so back in romans chapter 17 i just wanted to read that verse because he he tells him that 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 whom you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. They ignorantly worship, but they they're not without excuse. Does that make sense? Paul's not saying, well, you're you you're you guys are okay with God right now, but as soon as after this, now you're in trouble with God. No, 
they're still, they're still responsible. They still would go to hell if they did not believe the gospel. Okay? They, they, they don't get like a free pass as some people would teach. Well, the t- ignorance that God was letting wink at. No, that's not what he means. Keep reading. He says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth. Notice this next phrase. Dwelleth not in temples made with hands. If you go and look at the maps of the Oropagus and Mars Hill and and everything around there, you'll see there's just the, there's just the little shrine and little temple thing, and room after room, place after place, and they made this, they created this, and that limits, I should say, that limits the God to being there, and I've always been taught that a lot of people like idols because you can take the little idol and when you're like, I want to be naughty, you open up your drawer and you stick the idol in the drawer and you shut the door and then you can do, do, do all your naughty stuff and come back and pull the idol out of the drawer and stick them back up on your shelf and you know, you can, you can put them, it's God in a box. I can do what I want to do with them when I want them, but when I don't want them to see what I'm doing, I just, I just hide them. So here, when you kind of bring God to the elevation of, look, in just a second, he, he, he's the one that has created you and he is not made in a temple without hands, all of a sudden you start to go, well, no, this brings us to that point of the judgment you were talking about where you're telling me he's seeing everything that I do and he hears all I say. Yeah, yeah, he, he knows it all. And he records it all in a book. He records it all in a book. Wow, that's a little scary. Uh, could I get that book, you know, removed? Can I, can I delete it? You can get it cleaned out uh, through the blood of Christ, but you can't remove it without getting it paid for. So, this next phrase that he says here, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, that's what, that's what, you know, if you go back to Acts chapter 7, Stephen says a very similar phrase in Acts chapter 7 and verse number 48. Actually, in verse 47, I'm not going to, I mean, we might look at, well, you know, we'll go, we'll go over there because I want to I read these other verses too. And so go to Acts chapter 7, verse uh, 47, and then 2 Chronicles chapter number 6. So it says here, but Solomon built him an house, how be it? The Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Notice this next phrase. Hath not my hand made all these things? So when you make a God with your own hands, you're making it with stuff that God made, right? So when people are like, we invented something, and we, we, we found a new element. No, you didn't. I mean, that, that's God's element, you know. We, we didn't, you, you, didn't dis, you may have discovered it, but you didn't create it. They, they act as if they have so much power in the creation of these things. And Well, look at the new energy we're creating. Yeah, that's because God gives you the mind to be able to do that, right? So you, you, I think it's such, a, it's such a disservice to God, and I think it's very offensive to God, when, we, when God does not receive the glory for the things that he has done, right? So when you go, you didn't make that, I made this thing, I think, that's, that's like the worst thing you could do. You're basically taking that glory away from him and trying to put it upon yourself. And I, I do believe God is a jealous God. He, he, de- he deserves that glory, and he's the only one that should have it. So in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, I think when Solomon builds that temple, he gets it, and one would think, wow, they're building this, this great temple. Well, they're doing it for for the right reasons. And if you read in, in Second, Second Chronicles chapter 6, um, verse number 15, it says, Thou which hast kept with thy servant uh, David, my father, that which thou hast promised him, and spakest with thy mouth, and hast fulfilled it with thine hand, as it is this day. Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that which thou hast promised him, saying, There shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit upon the throne of Israel, yet so that the, that thy children take heed to their way to walk in my law, as thou hast walked before me. Now, then, O Lord God of Israel, let thy word be verified, which thou hast spoken unto thy servant David. But will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee how much less this house which i have built right i, I think it's just an appreciation for the, the deity and mag, the magnificence and the greatness of god he ends of course there in, in uh, verse 33 he says then hear thou from the heavens even from thy dwelling place so where does God reside? Where does he live? He lives in the heavens. And so what Paul is trying to tell these guys is, look, there's going to be a resurrection of you guys, and there is a God, 
And that, uh, in turn, creates accountability, responsibility, and ultimately a decision point that they have to make. So what's that decision point? Go back to Acts chapter 17. The decision point is that in your flesh, you cannot please God. So verse 25, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he, what? He needed anything. What are you going to give God? I always think about that and go, ooh, ouch. Kind of hurts. It's kind of a jab to your just your being, because everybody wants to contribute. Everybody really wants to. And I go, we've been studying this issue of repentance and this issue of turning from sin in the last four or five weeks in, in, a, in Wednesday night Bible study. And to me, that's people's attempt to try to help out God. Well, God, you know it's so good. I'll promise. I'll make the covenant. And I go, guys, did you not? Did you not ever read? The, the account of the Exodus and, and when they agreed to do all that the Lord has spoken. And God says, you sure about that? And, and they say, yeah, yeah, we're going to do it. And, they, you know, then they're going to, then in, in Exodus chapter, you know, 20 and 21, 22, 23, 24. And then in 25, Moses says, are you sure again that you guys really want to do this? Yeah, 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 we're good, right? And you just go, that's just a, that's the same thing you're doing when you tell God, I promise God, I'm never going to sin ever again. And then, you know, of course, they've changed that now. They've changed the phrase to, um, you know, you need to surrender it all or you need to be willing to turn from your sin. Whatever it is, it's a focus shift away from the cross of Christ. And it's a shift back upon this, the, the problem of sin, you, right? So what does God need? Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything. Does he need anything from you? No, I mean, nothing. You can't contribute to anything with God. God, the only thing he wants, he says, oh, are you a vessel? Meet for the master's use? Remember that pe passage in 2 Timothy chapter number 2? He goes through and says, hey, you can be a vessel, meet for the master's use, but it's not, you can't just, you know, show up one day and, and be like, yeah, okay, I I'm ready to go. You know, well, you got to know what to do. And then you also have to be, as Paul says, free from sin. So going on and reading, neither is worship with men's hands as though we need anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And notice this phrase, and hath made of one blood all nations of men. He really hammers the issue of what? And hath made of one blood all nations of men. One blood. No, he doesn't say, well, he made the Asians, and then he made the blacks, and then he made the whites, and then he made the Indians, and he made the, you know. No, he doesn't get into the, 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 the different, you know, heritages and, and, and nationalities. He says that, really, you came from one blood, and that one blood is who? What's well, Adam. Go with me to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis 11. And read with me this story. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go, go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone and, and slime, had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, after the flood, God had commanded Noah and his sons to go out and multiply. Remember? Do you guys remember some of that stuff? Multiply, verse chapter 9. It said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. He commanded them to go out. And, of course, they, they did not. Even when God took away all those wicked that were among Noah, guess what happens? Where does that wicked come from? It's still inside of them. This week in, at, at Bible study, Noah says, I want to learn. I, wa I want to stay. I want to learn. And I'm like, what do you want to learn about? I want to learn about Jesus. I'm like, oh, okay. So we let him sit down for a second. And I said, well, what, what do you want to hear about Jesus? I want to hear about the ark. And I said, okay. So I, we talked, Dave was there, and we talked about Noah's Ark for a little bit, and we kind of went through it, and, and so I said, but you know, at the very end, Noah was still a sinner, you know, he was, he was not, and I went through the, at the very end, and most people don't realize that, Noah at the very end of his life, you know, getting drunk and cursing his sons out and being naked, you know, it's like, that's the last recorded thing, 
but Noah is considered to be a righteous man of God. You know, it's weird because you're like, well, what about that? What about that instance? Uh, you know, where was his turn to repent? And, you know, I mean, it's all those kinds of crazy things that people try to come up with these concoctions. I'm just really happy I'm justified and God justified me when I was ungodly. So that's a great, it's a great feeling. I sh you should be very happy that God justifies the ungodly. And uh, that's, that's great. So in, in, you know, in, in Genesis chapter number 11, you still see that seed of, of Adam, that, that fallen you know, man inside of all of them. And you see in verse number five, and the Lord came down to the city and the tower, which the children of men built. This is Genesis 11, five. Uh, and the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore the name of it, of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all of the earth. So, you know, again, what does today's world want to do? I mean, they really want to, I think they want to unite. They want to make things happen. Really crazy, while we're here, I want to go over to Genesis 4. This is, this is my, it's my rabbit trail for the day. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 14. I was reading this, and I just want you to think about this. So, uh, Adam and Eve had two, two sons in the beginning, right? Cain and Abel. And, of course, they had Seth and, and go on through the rest. But in, in Genesis chapter 4, and uh, after, after, you know, uh, Cain, Cain talks with Abel there in verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him, right? And so, of course, God, the Lord said, Hey, Cain, where's Abel, that brother? And he said, Oh, I don't know. Uh, am I my brother's keeper? Right? And go down to verse number 14. When God gives him the punishment, he says, Behold, thou hast driven me out. This is Cain talking. He says, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And when I was reading that, I thought to myself, I'm like, every one that findeth me shall slay me. How many people are out there? So that's just a little aside to get you thinking about something. I'm going to talk about that in a later sermon. But pretty cool to think. What do you mean everyone? I mean everyone that's out there. I mean, how many people are out there? Why would everyone try to kill him? Where's the justice? Well, there's, there's justice. How does he know that, as he says here, I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond? How does he know what a fugitive and a vagabond is, right? How many fugitives and vagabonds did he have before him? Well, he's the first, right? Pretty interesting. We'll get into that because I want to talk about how that correlates with these verses in Acts 17 a little later. But go back to Acts 17 for a minute, and we'll finish this up. And he says here in verse uh, 20, 25, Sorry, 26. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So guess what? You don't get to live on Mount Everest. You know, people try to do that. I had a friend just tell me the other day, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna climb Mount Everest. I said, why? I just want to do it. I'm like, you have a 50% chance of dying. Why would you even bother trying to do it? It doesn't even sound fun. Well, it's an accomplishment, and, and I know this guy that did it. I'm like, well, how, how cool is he in your eyes because he climbed Mount Everest? You know. No, just, this, this doesn't really appeal to me. But the bounds of their habitation is, this is, you know, God has, God has set forth, these are the areas that you're going to live. And as you see, he did scatter out all the people of the earth. And so what God is trying to do, or not God is not trying to do, is men is trying to do today, is they're trying to unite what God has scattered, right? And so he tries to do that. And the United States of America is a great example of this. In the United States, why are we the best in, like, sports and stuff? Well, because we have the best of everybody. We're kind of like the MVP all-star team, you know? We got, we got, we got people from Africa. We got people from Europe. You know, we got people from South America. We have everybody. We're that, we're that proverbial mount, melting pot, as they say, right? So when you get all those people in, what is always going to be there? Well, what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, you know, we're all one. We're all united. Everybody's the same. And it's like, well, no, we're not because we all look different and we all have things culturally that we are more akin to liking and accustomed to. So what they're trying to create is this, this unity that's really not possible. So they're going to create a unity based upon a false lie. And so, of course, that's what the Antichrist will do. And it's pretty interesting if you go through, I'm not going to get through all of Revelation 17 today, but things to look at in a, in a future sense. And I, I say that because what, things, what is going to happen to do that is you cannot have multiple kings. In order to have a unity of a grouping of people, what do you have to have? You have to have a king. You have to have a ruler. And so what you'll see what happens is, is uh, if you read, and I'm going to read this actually. I, wanna, I really do want to read this to you guys. Uh, I've been telling, I mentioned this in Bible study last week. Uh, I said, 
I've been reading Thomas Paine's Common Sense. Have any of you guys read that before? I mean, t talk about like mind blowing. Like, I'm like, why have I not read this sooner? Like, that's how I look. I'm like, why did I not read this sooner? Why is this not read today? Let's, let's stop, you know. Me, me. You know, what's the net with the little emergency broadcasting thing that happens on your TV? Me, me, me. Attention, all people. We need everybody here to read common sense. Me, me, me. Like, seriously, that's what they need to do. They need to put it on TV and say, we're going to. Everything. No Game of Thrones. Sorry. It's, it's stopping today. No Game of Thrones. No Bachelor. We are putting on Thomas Paine and we're all going to read it. And we're going to do it on the screen. And we're going to do, you know, we're going to do a chapter every day for, for 15 minutes or something like that. And I think, number one, people would have an absolute conniption. They would lose their mind. They would lose their mind. The people would lose their mind. If you were to read this today, they'd be like, "You, oh, this is hate speech. This is bigotry. Oh, this is, you know, this is, whoa, this is not PC. We need to get rid of this thing. Because in the very beginning, he says, we have to learn from history. And it's really about the monarch aspect of why a monarchy doesn't work and why he, he basically says, uh, I'm going to read this thing. He says, um, he says, till then, their, their form of government, this is talking about the Jews, and, and he says, uh, till then, their form of government, except in ordinary cases where the Almighty interposed, was a kind of republic administered by a judge and the elders of the tribes. Kings they had nine, and it was held sinful to acknowledge any being under that title but the Lord of hosts. And when a man seriously reflects on the adulterous homage which is paid to the person of the kings, he need not wonder that the Almighty, ever jealous of his honor, should disapprove of a form of government which so impiously invades the prerogative of heaven and I'm like boom <laughs> you know it's like that guy is not he, he gets it he sees what's going on and he goes a real big detail about how you know these people that want authority they're doing it for the wrong reasons and how the how basically the the, the colonial revolution uh, you know colonial America uh, is is was this was passed out this was handed and this is this book was responsible this pamphlet really it's 50 or 60 pages long this pamphlet was responsible for the revolution and separation from England. I mean, more so than anything else. You know, you, you read that and you go, but he, he goes through history. He says, look, they wanted a king. And they looked at all the heathens and they said, they have kings? And God says, yeah, you got a king. And then he goes to the count of Samuel and Samuel and Samuel's sons and he goes, God, I just, I don't, I don't know what happened. They just, they were, they're rejecting me. They, they don't want me to, to tell them anything about what you have to say. They don't want my sons to say. And God's like, no, 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 they didn't reject you. They rejected me. And so he goes through the whole history of this and you go, yeah, this is it. This is why we need a, a, a true savior, not Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton and another shill. I mean, it's the same stuff. Nothing's going to change. Okay, how, how much is your life different that Barack Obama had eight years? Okay, that didn't, didn't really affect you too drastically. Now, of course, we can get into the details and the finite things. Sure, there are, yes, there are things that have, have occurred that are make things worse. Okay, no, no doubt. But for the vast thing, can you still worship God freely? You can. Can you still preach the gospel? You still can. Until that day happens, which it will come. I guarantee it. We're getting close to that. I say, this is not a prophecy. You give it another three to five years, we're going to see some major cases come into the, into the light, right? Of, of whether it be issues of abortion, of, of gay marriage, of LGBT things. Or I don't even like to even say that term. But any of that stuff, that's going to come in the limelight and Christians are going to have to make a stand. You watch. Watch the first major pastor, whoever it be. I always thought it was going to be Mars Hill. That was my thought. The big church out there with uh, Mark Driscoll. I always thought Mars Hill would be the one, and God, would, and that'd be funny to think like Mars Hill, the most idolatrous place, you know, back in the day, and they have a church called Mars Hill out in, I think it's in Texas, and they're going to be the one to do like the first gay marriage in, in the Christian church, and it's just ridiculous. But it's going to get pretty ridiculous. Things are going to get crazier. They're not getting any better. And so if you notice, there's the, and I, I hate to really harp on this, the, the gay thing. I'm not, I'm not really a gay hater. I promise. It's just that I have so many. Probably every time I share somebody the gospel, and they find out that I'm a Christian, well, what do you think about gays? Like that's the first thing that comes out of their mouth. Amen. I'm like, wow. I mean, I'm not even exaggerating. That was the first thing. I talked to a guy the other day. First thing out of his mouth was, what do you think about gays? I'm like, well, I could talk to you about it if you really like to know. I mean, yeah, it's a perversion. And yes, okay, it's a sin. And so, anyways, if they can just, if they can get to the point where they, they, would, they, would, they would acknowledge their sin before God, 
you know, they're in a position where they can be saved. You know, that's, that's what it is. If you, if you just don't, if you think, well, that's not a sin, well, that's, that's the major problem that I have. And those, those churches, I think that's what's going to happen is that you're going to get a major church, major institution to acknowledge that, accept it, and then it's just going to go crazy. And it's going to be hate speech to even say that it's a sin or it's wrong or it's whatever. But I, I encourage you guys to just study history. Um, and uh, Todd actually mentioned something really interesting. You know, Todd works at LifeLink, and he does the body procurements. He says, we don't take gays, period. You won't get a gay body in our, in our facility. We won't do it. So if a person's gay, we won't harvest an organ from them. We won't harvest their skin. We won't take a ligament from them. We take nothing. And I said, oh, better not let the news find out about that. I mean, they couldn't even donate blood until a couple years ago, and now, you know, it's, it's a year-long gap, I think, before don't want to get into the details of how gross the relationships are, but a, a year-long gap between uh, intercourse and then you can go ahead and, and uh, I don't know what call it intercourse, perversion, and then you can, uh, you can, sodomy, you can then have, you can then donate uh, blood again. But, you know, again, that's, this, just, this stuff is becoming so crazy. And just read, study, just study, really study, study like adultery laws and, and, and study sodomy laws and, and go through that. We're talking like 1970, 1980, and 2003 was the last time that that was all struck down by the Supreme Court. Go read, go, go look at the law. I mean, this is not like I'm making this stuff up. This, was, this is American history. And of course, what's the first thing out of anybody's mouth when it comes to trying to equate this? They have to equate that with slavery, okay? They have to equate it with the blacks. And they say, well, the blacks, no, no, you're born black, okay? You're born black. You don't get a choice in that matter. You're completely born. So that's why the, the gay debate is so much about being born that way because it becomes then not a choice and it becomes what they consider to be a protected class. So gender now is, is being on the radar because typically gender is a protected class. And the Supreme Court has held that. And when it's a, when it's a protected class, there's a thing called strict scrutiny that's applied. It's a, it's a test that the, that the government applies to uh, cases of discrimination or, 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 or so on and so forth. And so gender, right, things you don't get to choose. Where you were born, you don't get to choose. Like, okay, I was born in America. Well, I didn't get a choice to be born in America. You know, I was born there because my parents, it's a non-choice issue. Um, and so now the, the other one is, um, you know, again, the, the, the heterosexuality or sexuality, which, again, they're trying to make that not a choice. And so if you just read that, just go, just, I mean, this is, this is stuff that you need to be familiar with because I'm telling you, they've I get sold it. it. They've, sold they've sold it. The hook, line, and sinker, you're in. But, but I'm getting, I get asked, I'm not exaggerating, when I get asked almost every time we start having a discussion, it's within the first, I just had a talk with the other guy, a guy the other day, uh, actually it was yesterday at the party, we had a nice theological discussion, which happens pretty much every time we get together, and he was hammering me hard on the issue of homosexuality. What do you think the church says about that? What should the church's stance be on that? I'm like, you guys are really hung up on this issue, right? Like, I mean, they're just, yeah, I mean, like, it's not my position on the issue. I mean, read Romans chapter 1, guys. I mean, that's, that is what it is. So it's, it's just, I, I, it becomes, for me, it's going to become hate speech to even say anything like that. And, uh, but I encourage people to read history, like Thomas Paine saying, just go back to history. Look at the history. Look where we came from. Don't make the mistake again. And read through, read through adultery laws. Those are actually really interesting. Why do we have laws against adultery? And we made it criminal to have adultery. I mean, it was a criminal punishment. You could go to prison, and people went to prison for adultery. And you go, wow, that's, that's crazy. Don't you think that's crazy? Because people commit adultery every day. We got Tinder and Grinder and, I don't know, all these other things. Right? You got everything. Yeah, you get stoned for adultery. I mean, and, and how, how the whole thing about divorce and putting away your wife and divorce laws back in, in the United States. So you go, well, where did those all come from? Well, we created those based upon the, the Bible. Th those, those things really came. And when you read things from Thomas Paine, there's no doubt in my mind this guy's a believer. Okay? There's no doubt in my mind. He gets it. He understands it. He gets what's going on. He, uh, he, he had, it, you know, vehemently says that man is inherently sinful. He does believe that you know, Jesus Christ is the answer. You know? So um, Now, of course, you know, you got other guys. Thomas Jefferson we were just talking about. He's an Epicurean. Um, which most people don't realize. He's not like some big guy. And, and people, people say, well, by, well the, the, the money says, you know, in God we trust and the Pledge of Allegiance. A lot of stuff was added in 1950, but we can talk about that too. People don't realize those things. But you should be familiar with that stuff because it's going to be coming underneath attack. And organizations like the Christian Law Association, which I think some of you guys are familiar with, they used to be headquartered here in, in Seminole. Um, you know, the, the, now there's the, the uh, Religious Life and Liberty Campaign or whatever it is. That's the other one that they've come out with. What's going to happen is you're going to get guys from, you know, uh, a Muslim who's going to say, well, defend my religious liberty, you know, and then they're going to say, well, we don't want to do that. Well, no, you can't. You can't do that. You can no longer turn down that. If you're going to defend life, liberty, and religious freedoms, you have to defend now the Muslim's right to do what they're going to do. So it's, it's going to get crazy. And just keep in mind, um, Muslim and 
And Islam is not a race. You can't be racist and, and say that you don't agree with a Muslim. You know, people say, well, yes, yeah, racist. No, no, it's, it's not. It's, it's, I don't agree with their, their religious ideologies, their, their hatred, you know, their, their, their vitriol, their nasty. And th that's not racist. So come, somebody going to try to push that upon you, as I said, to hate a gay, not hate a gay, but to say that their act is sinful, to hate the sin of, of being gay, they're going to say, well, that's, they're going to try to equate that to being a racist. So just, just food for thought. Stuff's coming. It's coming down the pipes, and uh, it's going to be, it's going to get worse every day. So evil men and seducers will wax what? And what's he say? Deceived and being deceived, right? Deceiving and being deceived. So they not only deceive themselves, but then they also go out and, and deceive others with their, with their, with their doctrine. Hey, look at lobbyists. I mean, the whole thing's crazy. So. Yep. Because mm -hmm. they don't have any, they don't have any doctrine. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't believe anything that the Bible says. And the, the, the next thing they'll say is, well, well, he, he'll wear in two types of cotton. I'm like, if you, if you don't see a difference between wearing two types of cotton, okay, or two types of, you know, whatever, wool and cotton or whatever the thing is that they're not supposed to wear, there's a pro pro prohibition in the scripture about wearing intertwined clothing because it was reserved for the priestly uh, duties and things for separation. It was, it, was, it was a sign of sanctification. And so if they did that, it, they were trying to be like somebody that they weren't. And so they'll say, yeah, but I'll, if you can't see that, then I'm sorry, you're pretty much an idiot. That's the only thing I can really say. If you can't see a difference between wearing two types of clothing or mixing two types of fabric, right, and, and, and homosexuality, then you're, you, you're, you're perverted. Your, your brain has been uh, affected evilly by the devil, and you've been taken captive by as well. And there's nothing I can, I can't do anything for you. God's going to hopefully grant you the repentance of acknowledging the truth. Other than that, there's nothing else I can do. So we don't try to force our, 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 our views upon people because it's not our views. It's just establishing the truth of the word of God, being faithful to preaching it, and it's going to become hate speech. I'm telling you, I can see there's guys, lots of pastors are getting their YouTube channels in trouble. They get a strike on them because they'll get the hate speech strikes. So the things that I say in this, if they get popular, I wouldn't doubt for a second I'd get a hate speech strike on YouTube. For what? I mean, what I mean hate speech? I mean, I'm telling you, I, I got lots of love for every homosexual out there. They can all have justification freely, 100% freely, just like an adulterer can, just like a child molester can, just like anybody can. They can all be 100% forgiven of every sin. But what they don't want to do is they don't want to acknowledge that the act is sinful. And so that is a problem before God. Because then you say, well, what, did, did you not die for that sin, right? Did you not die for it? That, that was a sin that you didn't have to die for? Well, I think God's going to want you to see sin as, as he sees sin. That, to me, is the, the epitome of repentance. When you, look at, when you and God go, and you know what? I said this last week, and I'll say it one more time. It's incredibly relieving that God knows just how sinful you really are, okay? It's incredibly relieving because you try so hard to make everybody think you're better than you are, but God knows how sinful you are, and you're like, and you still justified me? Well, great. I'm happy about that, because I don't deserve it. I, I understand that, and as the publican said, he would not lift up his eyes toward the heaven, but smote his breast and said, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. All right, let's close in prayer. All right, dear God, we thank you every day for